great. Um, so we've already done our introductions. I, I suppose I should have said in my introduction that I've been an English teacher before joining Ofsted. I was an English teacher and head of English and English SLE. So, um, you know, I, I forgot to mention that and it's so important because um, I think the, 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 the reason that we're all here today, I think, is pupils. And I just wanted to, um, in my aims, just start with that. So these are the aims of what I'm going to do. And they're kind of the themes, if you like, of, of what I'm going to talk about. In the first section of the talk, I'll focus on how our new framework puts pupils at its heart. In the second section, I'll reflect on the English curriculum that we develop for our pupils, paying particular attention to the key factors that both research and inspection evidence indicate contribute most strongly uh, to an effective, uh, effective education. And then I think towards the end, I think I'll try and talk about this idea of disciplinary knowledge in English, because I think as subject teachers, we're very passionate about our subject. And it's important to recognise how disciplinary knowledge gives the subject its distinctive flavour and how teachers use this knowledge all the time in their, you know, every second to make minor decisions about the books they introduce, about the way they express things. So. First of all, a huge thank you to everybody, to all the teachers out there. It's a massive heartfelt thank you for all your hard work during the COVID crisis. I know you've been doing loads of work, whether it's been developing online lessons, developing paper resources to share with pupils, doing preparations for getting pupils back into school. We you know, really recognise the online provision for key workers and also the staggered return of different rear groups that's been going on. So a real, real thank you. Just reflecting on, you know, COVID crisis, there's been quite a lot of chat in the media about some of the things that we've got from the crisis. People have talked about things slowing down, being able to hear the birds. One of the things I've noticed is a lot more collaboration sort of between teachers, between schools, people working together, making a huge effort all combined with this kind of common thing, this common cause to try and get as many people as possible to reach out to people to maintain their learning. So that's one of the things that I've noticed. Um, so just to start to focus on this aspect of the talk, which is about the curriculum and pupils. Our focus on the curriculum over the past few years has put pupils at the very heart. We have not lost sight of this in our new framework. And I just want to explain what I mean by that. I just want to give you a moment to read this um, uh, interview with HMCI that was published in the Observer in 2018, so just before we started our framework. And I think it shows how pupils are at the centre of our work uh, on the curriculum. And in my blogs, personally, in the presentations I've done, I've really echoed this, especially this idea of all children having the right to audacious, challenging, interesting text, so they have a fulfilling education experience, one of substance and integrity, which is kind of, I suppose, the catchphrase, uh, the strap line, if you like, for our new inspection uh, framework. So I just want to talk you through the idea that we have, that I'm, I think many of you share, that the curriculum is a lever for social justice. Um, teachers are passionate, I think, about introducing pupils to new knowledge, kind of the essential knowledge of their subject. And a strong curriculum will enable pupils to deepen their knowledge progressively over time and apply it in those practices that are part of the discipline of English, sort of critiquing, looking at different readings, thinking about rhetoric, etc. The choices that you as teachers, that we as teachers make really matter. The books we choose for study, the books you yourself read um, is important. The books you read aloud, the references you make in passing, the extracts you might use to illustrate a point or demonstrate a specific feature really, really matter. And I think we've always been really good as a profession at weighing up all the different choices that we have about when we, when we um, make decisions. So, for example, the need for a diverse uh, diverse writing, different voices from a range of cultures is very important. But we also know, don't we, that texts 
don't have to provide a mirror image of, of people's own lives. And I've talked about that in my blogs. So it's not the case that, that people you know, have to see their own lives replicated. So if you think about great expectations and the struggles that Pip has with identity, his story parallels other struggles that, ch- that people in our cast rooms may have, whether it's with our, uh, gender or whether it's sexuality or other identity issues. And I've spoken before about something within the discipline of literature that I think we do hold dear, is that we kind of see through a glass darkly. We get much more than what appears on the surface. And that's really important that children are able to access that because that's a powerful knowledge. And that's a phrase coined, as you know, probably by Michael Young. And it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you've got power over other people. It means it's specialist knowledge about something that gives you power. It takes you beyond your everyday experiences and gives you access to knowledge of academic disciplines. And and I think that's part of like, I think that's really linked to cultural capital because that knowledge enables you to play a really strong role in society, to be able to spot, if you like, fake news, to be able to speak truth to power and all those other things. Uh, and, and to appreciate, you know, human creativity and achievement. And this knowledge is not the preserve of the few. This is what Ofsted believes. All, all should have access to this knowledge. And teachers provide the support to enable that to happen. So that's kind of a sense in which what we're talking about is the curriculum and social justice. And then finally, this idea of an inclusive curriculum, which I'm going to go into into a bit more detail. So inclusion in the EIF has been very strong. It's got a, a, a high prominence. And I think the idea was, was it's not an opposition to an ambitious curriculum, rather the other way around. An inclusive culture in a school enables pupils to engage positively with the ambitious curriculum provided rather than being excluded from it. So I think one of the things I'd like to discuss with you is how much of this building an inclusive curriculum really kind of links with what we do in English. So there's a big crossover and it's very pertinent to us as our English teachers. And I think we often feel very passionately uh, about inclusion. So obviously we've got this idea, and I'm sure you, you're familiar with Willingham's work and we reference it in our sort of research guide that goes with the handbook about the fact that you need to have some prior knowledge to understand and comprehend. So, so if you don't have that prior knowledge, you might be locked out of gaining an understanding from a text that you would otherwise have, have the capacity to do so. So you need to be given that so you can be included in that response to the text. I think we've always, you know, English has always had a functional aspect to it about kind of delivery of these functional skills. And I think in the past, we may have seen these skills as being quite quite general, quite cross-curricular skills. But now I think we're much more aware of the knowledge that you need in order to to perform a, a, a skill expertly. So when we think about literacy, I think we're much more aware of the grammatical knowledge that you might need to do that. And obviously, being able to read and write is essential for access to learning in other subjects. And finally, vocabulary. And I'm sure you're probably quite familiar with the research on vocabulary. Um, we referenced it. We referenced it in a lot of our research. But I think it's important to keep reminding ourselves of this. This huge landmark study from 1995. And I know that some people have kind of questioned the study. It is worth remembering that these are the words that were recorded. They can't say how many were known. But even if the gaps gaps narrow, it still shows how extensive it is. And what for me is so important is the role that schooling plays in narrowing this gap, how we can help close the gap by deliberately introducing pupils. And of course, English teachers play a a crucial role. Words like benevolent, vanquished, constriction, entrenched. These are kind of what's called the kind of tier two words. They're not necessarily unique to English, but the kind of words that we find in kind of, uh, I suppose, certain types of fiction, um, not all fiction, but certain types of fiction, and maybe through more formal, um, formal uh, non-fiction as well, academic books as well. So we we have this very important role in introducing them. And the other thing we have a role in is in developing a a, a kind of habit of reading for pleasure. 
So I'm just going to um, kind of reveal one by one just the evidence from On Reading for Pleasure and how it drives up attainment across the curriculum. And this is something that was published by the DfE in 2012. And it's quite good because it gives a really good overview of all the different research on reading for pleasure. And what you're constantly reminded of is the link between reading for pleasure and other things such as socio-economic factors, well-being, emotional well-being, all of which I think English teachers really know about. But it's often the English teachers who are promoting that. And, you know, even if it's across the school, it's often who are talking about the books they read. And that's why I mentioned, uh, you know, at the start about the books that we read as English teachers. So I just want to just zoom in, having said the word teachers, on Ofsted's curriculum research and what it says about teachers and subject knowledge. Because, you know, I, I know I, I really wanted to focus on pupils and teachers in, in this presentation and the importance of you as teachers and your subject knowledge. So as you may be aware, Prior to the um, EIF, we did quite a lot of research visits and we went and we did two types of research. We, we visited schools and trialed things out. We also did a big literature review. Um, in phase one, we explored the curriculum in the widest sense. Then we collected evidence on schools that were vested in the curriculum that identified themselves as being um, you know, having done some work on the curriculum. And in phase three, which is the one I want to talk about, we did this model of, you know, we tried out some of the aspects that you now see in our curriculum framework. So we did some modeling about what, ki what factors were most important. And this is what we found. That subject knowledge was of considerable importance when it came to designing appropriate progression through content. That's you and what you do as teachers. And that middle leaders with responsibility for leading subjects, which we call subject leaders in, in, in our handbook of curriculum leaders, having the right skill set and subject knowledge to carry out their roles effectively and develop staff. And that's why this event and the fact that on a Saturday morning people are here is so important and quite humbling as, as well. So um, just to think about this idea of um, I'm just going to go back teachers and how teachers structure and develop the curriculum sequence lessons and sequence learning it's interesting isn't it as English teachers we've noticed things that all of these bullet points begin with the word teachers and that's very very deliberate and I just want you to spend just a second just just reading these they may be there are great descriptors for good but what they show is that subject knowledge is paramount and this is what the research tells us as well. And I'm particularly mindful of one bit of research that I, I really like and often use, is it's by Beaumart et al in 2010. And they found that teachers with greater content knowledge, I call that kind of pure subject knowledge, have higher levels of pedagogical content knowledge. So the way that we teach English as opposed to kind of the books themselves which itself leads to greater attention to cognitive activation, i.e. developing pupils' conceptual knowledge, through example, summarising, questioning strategies, those kind of key strategies that we associate with the discipline. And I think that's a really important bit of research. And it's also backed up by research from Mers and Reynolds, and that's our very own Professor Mers, who you might know is the director of research, who found that teachers who rate their own subject knowledge more highly show a higher levels of effective teaching behaviours and better pupil outcomes. So we know that subject knowledge needs to be nurtured, cherished, uh, honed, etc. Um, some of you may know Claire. Um, she um, has a big role in research ed and she's also an English teacher and, and blogs about English. And I think this is um, a, a great blog um, that I like because Designing a curriculum is really complex, especially in English. And I've added and teachers to it because I think, first of all, some teachers have different roles. Um, people have talked about being assistant heads and English teachers. And of course, there's that aspect of where, where we're sequencing kind of a, a, a set of lessons, a sequence of learning, and we as individual teachers are responsible for that. But it's full of complexities or nuances, as I like to call them. So I'll give you an example, just throw one out. This classic kind of English thing is I always we always talk about having to um, 
to, to read whole texts rather than extracts, right? But occasionally, teachers sometimes use really carefully chosen shorter and longer extracts because they've got a conscious intent to teach pupils maybe about the timeline of the canon and different literary forms. So, for example, you might choose two of Gulliver's um, travels, voyages from the whole of Gulliver to illustrate um, enlightenment and satire. So, so, so two things kind of coexist at once, whole text, which kind of in the end, but also some, some well-chosen extracts. And we're constantly, aren't we, navigating our way uh, through this. And it's the work that we do um, on, on, with teachers talking to leaders and thinking about this that enables us to kind of really um, develop the curriculum so it delivers the kind of progression that we want, knowing the, the, the nuances, the special kind of twists of our subject. Um, and, and it is a great subject, but it is pretty complex. So now I want to come on, and I've kind of, uh, I really wrestled with this, thinking about <clears throat> the disciplinary in English and why it matters because it is really complex so just bear with me I've tried to make it but I didn't want to not talk about it because it's something I've been thinking about and thinking about how important it is uh, for a while so um one of the things I think it's really important is this you know this layer of knowledge and it is a layer of knowledge within English but it's not an easy thing and I'll talk a bit about why it's not an easy thing. I hope from the previous slides that you've seen that I've talked about the importance of subject knowledge and how key leaders are in kind of ensuring everybody's got that subject knowledge and working with teachers. And that's why I thought it was important to include this, because I think it's an important aspect of the work that we do um, to develop teachers and the training that we do with teachers. And it is, you know, like I said, it is complex. So let me try to define it. The Steen Council, as you may know, suggests that subject knowledge falls into two categories. And this is why I talk about disciplinary knowledge in this way. So she talks about substantive knowledge, which you might call in some schools content knowledge. That's what we teach as established fact, say the conventions of Gothic. It's, it's something that's got Warren and has got a reality, okay? So that's what, she, what we might call content knowledge. Disciplinary knowledge, by co contrast, is a curricular term for what people's learn about how the knowledge was established. It's degree of certainty, how it's revised by scholars or artists or professional. But it's also that part of the subject where pupils understand each discipline as a tradition of inquiry within its own, own distinctive pursuit of truth. Now, I know we all get twitchy when we talk about truth as English teachers because we recognise that literature is socially constructed. But I think, for me, what I take from that as an English teacher is about those overarching concepts and practices upon which everything rests. For example, that essential re uh, relationship between reader, text and writer and working out that they're not one. And that's a big sort of almost like a threshold concept. If you get that, then you, that kind of opens the door to lots of other things. Um, or the idea that, this, and that enables you to have different readings of a text. So Christine Council goes on to say that each subject is just that, a product and account of an ongoing truth quest, where through empirical testing in science, argumentation in philosophy and history, and logic in maths, or beauty in the arts. And this beauty bit in the arts is important as well, because there is an aspect of our subject, which is an extra complication, I think, which is that there's an aesthetic dimension, there's an experiential dimension to literature. That moment when we respond to a poem with our hairs on the back of our necks going up. So that's something else, that's an extra bit of our subject that makes uh, talking about the disciplinary particularly complex, but I'm going to try and do it. So let's just think about it in this, um, in this extract. So we've got a lovely picture of um, uh, 19th century London there with those lovely carriages. And I want you to imagine a task where you're doing a successful evaluation of Dickens' description of London, say, the start of Bleak House. And you might draw on some component knowledge to do that. So historical knowledge, 
uh, knowledge of how to write an evaluation. So that's kind of the, the practices. And then there is some kind of big, big knowledge about who's describing the scene, what is conveyed, perhaps some themes that you might be looking at, whether they're subverting the conventions. But the disciplinary concept would be the authorial view versus the narrator's view. This idea that there's no such thing as an objective description, that a description at the start of Bleak House is through the eyes of, sort of, has got a kind of angle, a point of view. It's sometimes through the eyes of the narrator, sometimes through the eyes of character. In Bleak House, you have the sense that it's probably through the eyes of someone who is caught up in all that chancery, endless trips to chancery court, because the description, as you probably know, contains no finite verbs. So it's, it's constantly never-ending feel to it. So that's what I mean about the key overarching disciplinary concept. And if we know that, it's really important because that's going to help us with this, the pedagogical approaches that we choose. Because it will help us choose the cog site bits that are going to work best within the grain of our subject. And I think it's really important that we, we continue to recognise the difference between the curricular aims and the curricular things we do and the pedagogical approaches that we use to deliver those aims. And when we have this disciplinary knowledge, we're able to make really expert decisions about which, which approaches work best. And as teachers, I think we really, as English teachers, we really appreciate the importance of placing the text at the centre of all we do, not getting too far from it. So what I mean by that is, you know, um, just enough subject knowledge, background knowledge of Dickens or, or Britain Victorian times to enable children to enter that, that text imaginatively, but not so it becomes the history lesson. And that's what I explained there. How comparison can act like a lens. So sometimes comparison, isn't it great that it makes the invisible visible comparison? But if you compare it with the wrong poem or you don't choose the right text, it can cloud it and make it more difficult. And then, of course, more recently, the disciplinary has guided us in thinking about our online resources and our online curriculum. So it's really important. I often think the disciplinary is something that we know more often by its absence so when we go to an English lesson, we see sort of knowledge sprinkled like sugar, facts that don't, don't really help us to kind of get to, the, to, 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 to our, a deeper understanding. Um, key concepts missing or not deepened over time. And then this disconnected set of skills. And then I think one of the big things about the disciplinary is that if you, if you don't have the disciplinary, you can't deepen the conversation you have with literature. And this is a really big idea that impacts on sequencing as well, is that literature as a conversation, Robert Eagleston um, coined the phrase, it's, it's his phrase. Um, I think what it means like that is just like a conversation, you return to that at different times. So you might do Blake in, in year seven, and you might do it in year 13, and you return to the conversation, but the second time you've got something additional to bring to the conversation. Uh, and that's why the National Latch Curriculum actually talks about um, text being revisited in Key Stage 3. So I just wanted to talk about this, literature is a living conversation, because I think it's such a great phrase uh, of Robert's, because it's from a book when he tries to ask, she, he's asking the question, what is literature? And he decides that the right question is why literature matters. And he comes up with this metaphor of a living conversation. But for me, part of having a conversation is you need to bring knowledge to that conversation, maybe knowledge of the structures of conversation, turn taking. Um, and the other way I think in which this metaphor works for me about kind of English or literature being a conversation is uh, this literature often is self-reflexive. It, 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 you, books sometimes about, are about, about the process of writing. <clears throat> and often after a conversation, you reflect on that conversation, how the conversation went, what you should have said, what you shouldn't have said, how you perhaps should have said things in a different way. So that's the other way in which literature is like a conversation. But earlier on, I talked, when we first talked about discipline, about this idea, this is also an art form. We have an emotional response to it, or an aesthetic response. And I wanted to close this um, presentation with this idea because I think it, it is quite complex. Um, but I'm thinking about that hair on the back of our neck moment and how certain poems really move you. 
But for that to happen, you do need some well-chosen knowledge, some knowledge that, you, you know, that teachers with their disciplinary expertise um, share. And it's that, that one bit that's going to bring it all alive and make it make sense. And it's often knowledge about symbolism. That's why I've used this quote, because sometimes it's that understanding of the symbolic or the iconography that really helps you to engage in something more. So I'm going to show this with um, this picture by Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci called Lady with uh, the Ermine. So um, I have an aesthetic response to this. There's a sense of hope. I can see the ethereal beauty. There's that kind of sideways look, the longing. But there's some bits that I'm going to find out that may be deep in that. So Ermine was a symbol of wealth and pregnancy. So suddenly this is a young woman who may be pregnant, which kind of adds an extra dimension. The second thing is that the necklace is, is jet and that links to a secret lover. So there's something about the pregnancy and the romance and the passion there and the secret lover. But also the lover had a nickname, which was White Ermin, which also makes you think about the power relationship between these two people as well. And my aesthetic response, I feel, is deepened. It's not changed. It's, it's added to by the knowledge. But obviously, if it was lots and lots of facts about the life of Leonardo da Vinci, where he's born, I think it was just outside of Florence, it wouldn't be the same. So it's those well-chosen uh, bits of background knowledge. So I'm going to end with a kind of hair on the back of the neck poem and I'm really interested in yours and I think Caroline's talked about you contacting me and we'll talk about that in the end but I'm think I'm really interested in your hair at the moment hair on the moments but before I I read this poem it does it, I do have a profound emotional response to this I had to be quite careful about choosing poems because I'm quite able to kind of weep when I when I read some things as we all are it's written from the point of view of a young airman up in the clouds in World War One and he's preparing to die he muses that he didn't join up with any sense of patriotism or duty or the cheering of crowds. He feels no love for those he guards or hatred for those he fights. It's indifferent, almost anti-heroic. But because of my subject knowledge, playing in the background in my hinterland are three other First World War poems. Dulce de Coromest, Hardy's Drummer Hodge, which I think is before the First World War, but is, is relevant, and Brooks' poem, If I Should Die, Think Only This of Me. And they're a kind of backdrop that's assisting me in thinking more deeply about how the poem presents this young man who feels a close affinity with a place in County Galway. But even this attachment is couched in fairly neutral terms. But nevertheless, he's prepared to die and do so fairly willingly. And what actually is more heroic than ordinary people giving up their lives in this way? And so as he contemplates his death, he actually in the clouds, in that aeroplane, owning the sky as he does, feeling that sense of freedom, freedom, he's actually ironically unusually alive, more alive than he might be at any other point in his life. And he feels that freedom. And that experience almost tra is transcendent. It almost goes beyond the, the death, but not quite. And that adds to the poignancy. So. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, guard I do not love. My country is Kilcartan Cross. My countrymen, Kilcartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. Nor law, nor duty bade me fight, nor public men, nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed wasted of breath. A waste of breath, the years behind. In balance with this life, this death. 
hair on the back of the moment mo moments is what we all want our pupils to have because they are they they are transformative and it really motivates us doesn't it so i'm really interested to hear what your poems are which ones make your hair on the back of your neck stand out? And that's where I really want to conclude uh, this discussion and this talk. I hope you found it um, interesting. I'm sure it will generate some questions. I think the idea is, Caroline, that we're going to do that through, um, through Twitter. And I'm going to have a bit of chance to kind of have a look at those. I will have to kind of um, share them with people in Ofsted because it's, it's going to be on public on Twitter, but I will respond to them. But if you want to just, um, you know, I'm really interested in what your favourite poems are as well, because that's been a bit of a thing during COVID as well. So if you want to drop me a line saying read this poem, I'd, I'd be absolutely delighted. Uh, and just to say thank you very much. I'm going to try and get to the point now where I can stop sharing. So just bear with me while I do this. Um, can you still hear me? A, a huge thank you to you for that wonderful opening to the conference. Um, I have tweeted out to people that Sarah obviously wants to hear your um, hair on the neck, back of the neck poems and please just remember to use that hashtag TENC, so Team English National Conference online there's been some wonderful discussions already and i'm delighted to say there's 440 english teachers with us this morning which is a fantastic number for what it's worth my own personal poem that i would choose is adrian rich's waking in the dark um, the opening to that the thing that arrests me is how we are composed of molecules and um, without our knowledge consent it always just gets me every time so that's my Caroline. Thank you so much. So I'm going to hand over now um, to Mark and Matt, who have possibly got the best um, title for a session that I've had before. So we've got Mark. Matt, are you there? Yep. Wonderful. And Mark, if you're ready to share your screen, we'll get kicked off. Just one moment. I'm just still seeing Sarah's screen at the moment. That's okay. I should just overwrite it if you share yours, my love. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. So do also keep using the Q&A. We've had some great questions already. Um, like Sarah said, the answers to those won't be instantaneous, but we will make sure that they all get passed on um, and they're thoroughly appreciated.